Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're back. I'm back. Um, today, today, I'm going to jump right into it. Today, I want to talk about rhythm in writing. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a lot has been written about writing. It's kind of funny. It's kind of meta, really. The importance of spelling, of editing, of grammar, fleshing out your character's backstories, the hero's journey. I mean, we're talking, you know, Western-style writing here. There's a lot about how it sounds to the ear, and why is that a big deal? Um, especially when the story's on the page, and it's not an audiobook, maybe there aren't immediate plans to make it an audiobook. Okay, so let's try something. Right now, where you're at, if, if there's a book where you're at, if not, you can do it later, Go grab a book off the shelf, just open it to a random spot, read it through to yourself silently. Follow the words with your eyes and let your brain interpret them in its own way. And sit and digest what you've read and really consider the story. Now read it aloud. You can read it the same way you just read it in your head or you can change it up a little bit if you don't feel you got it right the first time. You notice something about reading it out loud there are several somethings. There's the expression in your voice. There's maybe you do a character accent, well or badly, depending on your ability. There's the accent on the syllables, the syllables. There are the pauses in the middle of the sentence or between sentences. Those are done differently. Is that last part that I'm really interested in here. The pauses, the accentuation, which is not to be confused with accents, although I'm sure your voice sounds just the same as mine does when I'm reading Winnie the Pooh, just like Jim Cummings, totally professional. Rhythm. The way your voice moves through the story. Because the way your voice moves through the story is different, at least to an extent, from the way your brain moves through, or at least registers, the story. And that's a good point, I think. Your brain doesn't move through the story the same way that your voice does, or at least it doesn't register things in the same way. Your brain will skip words that it deems superfluous, like ands or these, or other words. It depends on the story, the narrative you're reading, what your brain feels is superfluous and what it doesn't. It can even skip around. It can skip to the end of the page. It can skip to the end of the sentence and then come back. But no matter what, your brain is taking all this in and it's putting it together and making a cohesive story out of it. So basically, brains are really cool. It's all part of reading comprehension. It's not just understanding how to read something like the grammar and spelling and all that. It's how to read it. It's how to comprehend it. You're getting that rhythm in your brain. This is how you learn. This is how you learn patterns in speech. We get clues for this from our earliest moments, listening to other people, listening to the way they talk, the rises and falls in their speech, the pauses, the way your voice goes down when you're finishing something. The voice in your head tells the story, and it does the same thing even if you're not conscious of it. It rises, it falls, it hesitates to let you know more is coming, and then it continues. It pauses, it stops, though usually it stops like that. But despite all that, it's, it's off-putting to read a story that's off-rhythm, or seems to be to you. Now, why might this be? Let's get back a couple of paragraphs here. You're reading silently rhythm is different from your reading aloud rhythm. As far as your comprehension goes, it's the same thing. So you would think that it would come out the same way when you're writing, but that's not necessarily so. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist or anything like that, but reading aloud and reading silently probably use different parts of the brain in order to arrive at that comprehension. Some people don't even read silently with a voice in their heads. Um, some do, some don't. So if you don't, it's possible this may make it trickier to write in accordance with what a silent reader might expect. For everyone, particularly those without an inner voice experience, 
For everyone, though, please read your work aloud. Even for those of us with an inner voice, it's a different thing reading it aloud. There are many glitches you don't notice until you do that. And this can alleviate a lot of problems, um, as well as problems with getting it published because editors and agents are also readers. And now I'm wondering something. I'm wondering if... You know how people tend to be audio learners, visual learners, kinetic learners, more likely some combination thereof, but there's usually one that's dominant. So I would think that people who are visual learners would have an easier time with writing for silent reading, but perhaps I'm wrong. And a writer can be any type of learner. There's no rule saying otherwise. So in any case, in any case, just read it aloud to yourself and get an editor if you can. That's the best thing, no matter what type of writer, or learner, whatever that you are. All that said, many writers develop their own rhythm. It's a rhythm that's going to make sense to readers still, but it's a balance between that and your own voice. It's the kind of thing that's only going to come through experience and trial and error. But finding your own voice is important. It's a case of learning the rules and then figuring out which ones you want to break. And that may even vary from writing project to writing project, depending on the type of story you're telling. But it's good because if all writing sounded the same, then we'd have a lot less people reading than we do. It'd be a lot less interesting. A personal example, I have started using run-on sentences quite a bit in my work. That is because I've been writing in first-person narration a lot. So I write the sentences the way they would run through someone's brain. Of course, what I'm writing is something that somebody else is going to be reading, and they're not going to want to read a lot of run-on sentences. So I find a balance between that and breaking up the paragraph. I'll have a long sentence and a short sentence, maybe a couple shortened sentences, and then one broken up by a semicolon. This makes a good rhythm within the paragraphs. And then there's also the rhythm within the sentence to consider. How do the words play off each other? How does the sentence sound when you say it to... How does it sound to the ear? This is why we spend so much time as writers searching for the right word. We want to find the right sentence, fragment rhythm, the right sentence rhythm, paragraph, chapter, story. And that's how we write. That's craftsmanship. That's how the story becomes. I'm going to try something here. A little experiment. Let's read excerpts from a few different writers. If you followed my videos at all, and I hope you have, <laughs> this ties in with something I did a while ago, um, writing in different writing styles, the styles of different authors. So consider this one a sequel. I would share my own writing, I would, but I don't have anything new, and it's the new raw stuff that shows the imperfections the best. So I'm gonna pull from established writers. I have opinions. We all have opinions. Writing is a subjective thing. You're not gonna agree with a lot of my opinions, and I'm not gonna agree with a lot of yours, and that's fine. I, there's room for everyone. That's kind of the point here. Example number one, a confederacy of dunces. I don't know if you can see that, uh, but it's a confederacy of dunces. Uh, for each excerpt, I'm going to go with a narrative, a description excerpt instead of dialogue, um, because I feel that shows more of a rhythm instead dialogue has its own rhythm description has a different one so in any case there are, all the excerpts are going to be similar excerpt number one lana had taken some time to assemble the little collection of props while the plainclothesman had been coming in at night she had been too worried and preoccupied to attend to this project for george there had been the major problem of darlene the vulnerable point in lana's wall of protection against undercover policemen but now, the plainclothesmen had gone away as suddenly as they had appeared. Lana had spotted each one as soon as he had entered, and with Darlene safely off the stools and practicing with her bird, the plainclothesmen had nothing to go on. Lana had seen to it that they were actively ignored by everyone. It took experience to be able to spot a cop, but a person who could spot a cop could also avoid a lot of trouble. 
Excerpt number two. This is White Fox in the Forest. This is one of my kids' books. I have not looked at any of these prior to. I just opened them, glanced at them, and found a descriptive part. I didn't want to. I wanted these to be cold reads, as it were. That evening, they rested underneath a huge banyan tree. Tyrone fell asleep first, breathing heavily, followed by Little Bean, who emitted a high-pitched snore, then Ankle, who twitched as he dreamt. But Dyla tossed and turned, unable to fall asleep. After searching for months, they'd finally found the enchanted forest, and they'd also found the waterfall that, according to Fario's instructions, was what they were looking for, the spring of reincarnation. So, why hadn't they been reborn? Was the spring of reincarnation merely a rumor, or had they been misinformed? This is getting more exciting. Number three, a little book called The Hobbit. I'm not, I don't know if you've heard, I've never heard of it. What is this, The Hobbit? The sun had long gone behind the mountains. Already the shadows were deepening about them, though far away through the trees and over the black tops of those growing lower down, they could still see the evening lights on the plains beyond. They limped along now as fast as they were able, down the gentle slopes of a pine forest, in a slanting path leading steadily southwards. At times they were pushing through a sea of bracken, with tall fronds rising right above the hobbit's head. At times they were marching along quiet as quiet over a floor of pine needles. And all the while, the forest gloom got heavier, and the forest silence deeper. There was no wind that evening to bring even a sea sign into the branches of the tree. Now, none of these examples have what you might call an off rhythm. I don't have an example of that right now. I'm sorry. I'm so unprepared, okay? They're understandable, easy to read aloud, more or less, but the rhythm's different for each. So let's dissect a little. In a confederacy of dunces, we have a paragraph full of longer sentences. There are no short sentences in this paragraph. At least half the sentences I'm noticing just from reading this have a comma in them, but not all of them do. Most of the ones with a comma in them are in the middle of the paragraph. I find that very interesting. A lot of us have trouble with commas. The thing about commas, and I'll cover this more in another video, the thing about commas is they tell us when to pause. We don't always know otherwise. We have to find that rhythm as we read. That's what I was doing, because like I say, these are cold reads. I hadn't looked at these before. So, especially as I went on through the paragraph, I was finding the rhythm of the paragraph more and more as I went on. Ooh, I just thought of something that is not in my script. I, I do kind of jot down beforehand what I'm going to say in these videos, but word repetition or phrase repetition. Look here. It took experience to be able to spot a cop, but a person who could spot a cop could also avoid a lot of trouble. He that the writer, John Kennedy Toole, that is, he is repeating that phrase for emphasis. This is another thing I like to do a lot. I'm very, very picky about repeating phrases or repeating words within a sentence or even a paragraph or even a story. If it's a short story, I'm like, mm, I already used that word. It's a really noticeable word. I don't want to repeat it and be the person who uses this word a lot. Because when I'm reading a book, I notice that and it bothers me. So I don't want to, when I do repeat something, I do it for emphasis. The second time is kind of like an underlining of that phrase. This is important. I want the reader to notice that. Okay, in the second book, what we have is we have a listing of the characters and there's a quick little thing about how they fall asleep, which shows their differences in character. I like that a lot. And then there's a little bit about the plot, which makes me kind of understand what's going on just from this paragraph. So after searching for months, they'd finally found the Enchanted Forest, and they'd also found the waterfall. That, so what we have is we have one thing that happened, we have another thing happened. That, which leads us into the next part of the sentence, according to Fario's instructions, was what they were looking for. So there's the next part. That kind of wraps up the, the first thing. And what they were looking for is the spring of reincarnation. And what was wrong with the reincarnation? There's the musing about that. Why hadn't they been reborn? Was the spring of reincarnation merely a rumor? Or had they been misinformed? Three different questions. All the questions that are arising from this conclusion. Last example, this, this little book that nobody's ever heard of. 
I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Here's where you're really going to disagree with me. Most people do. I don't care for Tolkien's writing. Just reading it, these sentences don't work for me. It's hard for me to understand what's going on. When I read something like, they limped along now as fast as they were able down the gentle slopes of a pine forest and a slanting path leading steadily southwards. There's very little punctuation. And it's very difficult for my brain to register where the pause is, what has importance in that sentence as compared to something else. How does the slanting path relate to the pine forest, relating to steadily southwards, relating to the people who are on that path? It's very difficult for me. It was actually easier for me to read this aloud because, like I say, I was able to find the rhythm as I went through it. And I find that very interesting and deep. A lot of people say, oh, it's an old style of writing. That's why you can't get it. I have read many books in an old style of writing and I could understand them. So I just, it's a lack of punctuation and putting things in the sentence phrasing the sentence in a way that just doesn't work for my brain and the way I comprehend things. As far as I'm concerned, the man just needed an editor, but you know, we all have our opinions, don't we? So again, point being, these styles, these styles are not for everyone. Different styles in different books, not for everyone. It's interesting how different styles catch the eye and others don't like some are pleasing to the eye and others aren't it's like music right some of it is like oh that's really pretty and others like oh it's discordant to us it's interesting how our eyes process it in the same way as our ears except differently reading and art they're both music for the eyes except we process both of those differently and of course there are many different styles of art and we process all of those differently as well the neat thing about books is that you can read them aloud, and they frequently are. And that means that the written word can be processed by our brains in both manners. Conversely, the spoken word can be written down. But it's not such a simple thing as just reversing the process. Like, audio to written is different from written to audio. Again, brains are just, they're so cool. And they're confusing. And they're cool because they're confusing, I guess. I, I think so. I hope I'm the same way. I think what my point is, is that this is a roundabout way of saying, read your work aloud. It's only going to improve it for those reading silently, and it's definitely going to improve it for those reading aloud. So it's the best of both worlds. And what's an author whose prose you really admire? What's their rhythm like? And what's your own rhythm like? Would you like to share an excerpt below? Would you dare? I hope so, but if not, that's okay. It's perfectly understandable. Either way, I hope that this topic was something helpful and something to think about, and I hope to see you again next week. Bye!